Hello, everyone. Sorry, we're a bit late. Yeah. yeah. Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's meeting, the first for 2023. And thank you for everyone. your patience, everybody, as we logged on. We've broken a camera today in our little office here. And so it took us a wee bit longer to get organized. Um, let's start because it's always a very short, sharp and efficient meeting this one. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that this event takes place on the Wurundjeri land and the land of the Burong people. Uh, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are present today. We acknowledge that Aboriginal sovereignty has not been ceded and, remain, and that Aboriginal <clears throat> and Indigenous colleagues and friends remain strong in their enduring connection to land and culture. Um, as we go through the evening, could we just ask you to introduce yourself during the using the chat function? Because if we do go round, uh, we're getting to be such a big group, it takes up just a little bit too long. So if you could introduce yourself, then that we can uh, get a recording of who you all are and where you come from. When you're not speaking, if you could mute the microphone. And we are recording the meeting, editing it and uploading it onto the search website. <clears throat> if you wish to have an anonymity, if you could just please inform uh, search admin. Um, we're going to start as, as, as we quite often do with um, Carolyn McCarble from 1800 My Options with a snapshot of the current landscape. Um, the data that 1800 My Options uh, is able to collect um, through um, its interactive web based um, program has become more and more um, uh, powerful in influencing both the direction of the Clinical Champions Project activities and our advocacy with the government. Um, so, once again, Carolyn, thank you very much for your snapshot of where we're at around Victoria. Thanks so much, Patty. Um, and thanks everyone for coming along. It's great to see such a big group. Uh, we've been really, really busy at 1800 My Options. So we are, we've seen a significant uptick in number of calls since around about uh, August of 2022. And uh, in 2023, we're averaging around 650 to 670 calls a month. So within those calls, the general um, spread of call and needs is pretty standard. So we are still seeing the same proportion of people who are looking for abortion. So around about 85 to 90% of our callers are looking for an abortion service. But amongst that, there's been some changes in what we're seeing and particularly for gestation. I know that I've been talking to you all about this a lot, but um, for callers that are later gestation, it has increased significantly again this year. So in February, 9.2% of our callers were over 18 weeks, which is obviously really tricky to find services for because there's only one clinic that can um, support someone with their abortion needs beyond uh, around about 16 weeks currently in Victoria. So that pressure gets pushed through to the Royal Women's Hospital. Uh, we're also though, as a proportion, although the number itself isn't particularly lower, but we've had the lowest number of people as a proportion under nine weeks calling the service. So it was only 67% of our callers in February were under nine weeks. And our average is normally about 75 or so. And this is really demonstrated in the fact that we had about 14% of callers that were over uh, 12 weeks. So it's not just that there's a big number over 18 weeks, it's a big number over 12. I think this is um, 
basically a result of a system that's been struggling for several months now. It's often really difficult for people to access services. We're getting a lot more reports from our callers about the difficulty of accessing bulk billing GPs for workup, as well as even bulk billing ultrasound. It's really, really tricky to find bulk billing ultrasound services. We have been doing some work on this. So for people that are looking for low cost or bulk build ultrasounds, we do have a number now in Melbourne on our system, which is really great. So I'd really encourage you, if you've got patients looking for bulk billing ultrasounds in Melbourne, um, to give us a call. For other services, it's for other areas of the state, it's a little bit more tricky because the services are far uh, fewer, but we do have a few in a couple of regional centres. But if anyone is working in a regional centre and they know of an ultrasound service that is less than $100 for a dating scan or bulk build, we'd be really keen to learn about them so we can add them to the system because our callers are really appreciating when we can give them those details. Uh, so in terms of the other barriers that people are facing, we've again had another increase in international students calling. Um, so it's around about 9% of our callers currently are international students. Obviously, there's a lot of barriers for international students accessing abortion, partly their insurance policies not allowing pregnancy services in the first 12 months, but also just navigating the system is particularly complicated. So if uh, international students are requiring a little bit more support over the phone to help them to figure out what they need to do next. We're also continuing to see uh, significant rates of family violence, reproductive coercion, and other complex health issues that people are experiencing that are actually causing barriers for them to be able to access the abortion services that they're looking for. Uh, and in terms of data, I'm actually really excited to say that about 20 minutes ago, the Victorian Women's Health Atlas was updated with the 2021 medical abortion data, IUD data, Implanon data, and adolescent birth rate data. So all of those data sets have been put on the Atlas to 2021. So I will put a link here in the chat for that. Now, if you can't see the 2021 data, you'll have to refresh your cache. So that's basically emptying all your memory. And another trick to get around that is to open up an incognito browser window if that's what you want to do. And yes, I really want to see 2022 data up there as well. So we've made that a priority because 2021 is showing some slightly concerning things. Uh, we've seen it significant drop in Implanon uptake across the state. Alongside that, there has been an increase in IUDs, but most of that increase in IUD access has been in Melbourne, except where there are sexual and reproductive health hubs, which across this data are really beautiful little beacons of sexual and reproductive health access in Victoria. You don't have to know where a hub is geographically, it will pop up as a little light on the map when you're looking at the sexual and reproductive health indicators, particularly for 2021 and 2020. If anyone wants to talk about that Atlas data, please get in touch with us. You can get in touch with Women's Health Victoria who have put that data up. 1800 My Options is a service of Women's Health Victoria and we're also happy to really support people to get a better understanding of what that data means for their regions and how 1800 My Options experiences um, relate to that data and our understanding of the service system and caller needs. So I will stop there. I know we've got a busy meeting. Thanks so much, Patty. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, does anybody have any questions for Carolyn? from her data. Certainly one of the standout things for me when I've looked at the data and you've walked me through it quite recently, which has been really helpful, is that <clears throat> as you say, the hubs are the little beacons and will become the train the trainer hubs if we can get more funding. And we're also very cognizant of the fact that the government has uh, indicated that they will announce nine more hubs. So we'll get a doubling 
of the hubs. And so, uh, you know, when you're only got eight and uh, and eight or ten or eleven, and four of them are within the ring road, it's not a it's not a good enough spread. There are these huge areas. You know, we were talking about the Grampians the other day. Um, that just are really underserviced. So we're really hoping that your data, plus the experience we have with the Clinical Champions Project, um, supporting those who are running hubs and upskilling them with IUD insertion, for example, that we can use that model to really uh, improve our reach and train more of these hubs as they get going. So it's a, it's it's really helpful to have this backup data for. Mm. Uh, advocacy and funding and training ongoing. And I just wanted to also have a shout out for all of those that have either been trained recently or who are about to have uh, their practice just um, peer reviewed. Um, uh, the Bendigo team and um, CCP are going to have a get together on Thursday and just uh, do some collegial working together on the IUD service. Um, we had a great time when we went down to Bairnsdale recently as well. And um, hi, mm -hmm. Heather, nice to see you there. Mm -hmm. And it really seems to improve the uptake of the service. So a shout out to you all. And while I'm shouting out, could I just shout out to Joe Labbott and say we are so proud to hear, mm -hmm. Joe that you have just obtained your um, advanced practice, your nurse practitioner qualification phenomenal and uh, just delighted to have you on board and the work that your hub is doing, uh, you and Karishma are really smashing it up there and we're really, um, really pleased that you're here tonight too. Thanks guys. <clears throat> um, we're going to just change the order of things a little bit. Somebody. Oh, oh I think um, Sarab had his hand up. Oh Sarab, did you have your hand up? Uh, no, no, I just congratulated. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So it was a clap. You yeah. Were clap. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Um, so I'm just going to change the order a little bit and go from the little clinical update that I had prepared for you because I've heard recently from so many of you around the state about um, progress. And so I just want to move from that slightly depressing data that we're getting that the demand is going up and it would appear that the uh, ability to meet the demand particularly for the later later gestations that we're really struggling with that so but I thought I would tell you about the the wins that we've also had going around Victoria and so I've been in contact with quite a number of uh, a, a number of you in the hubs around Victoria in the last week or so and I wanted to share some of those updates and then if we have time um, uh, we can do a, a clinical presentation. <clears throat> uh, anybody else that I haven't been in touch with that wants to um, share what's been happening in your area, please jump in and there will be time for everybody um, to share what's going on. Um, I think I'll start with those of you who are here and then I've got some emails and messages from those of you who couldn't come. So. Um, I think we've got Anne Hodgson here, haven't we? From yeah, Barwon Health. We have indeed. That's right. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Um, um, you're not looking very well because <laughs> no camera yes. there. No, my camera died a while ago, and apparently the clever Apple people can do nothing about it. So I have a brick, unfortunately. So Anne, um, would you like to yeah. tell people where you're up to with Barwon Health. So mm. Well, Barwon's, Barwon's pretty much chugging along as we've always done for the last, you know, I don't know how many years of 20, you know, 20 some years we've been here providing the public service. Um, and we uh, did a study some in the early 2000s where we're the, in fact, it was a, it was a DHS funded study looking at how many people we were servicing from the area using postcode data. And probably at that stage, we were around 50%. Um, uh, of the women of the women who came from the postcode areas that Barwon and um, region uh, service were having their terminations through Barwon Health <clears throat> through the public hospital, so um, that's always been a strong point of Barwon. What's been a weak point has been, uh, and we've been relative medium reason quite good with um, our MS two step with medication abortion too. The GPs have have taken that up relatively. Um, 
you know, strongly in the region. If I look at, if I sort of compare to other regions, where we've really we haven't had an, an option. And this this was um uh, what's the word um this was demonstrated to me by colleagues who who did do private abortions through um, a private provider in in Melbourne, right, regional Melbourne was private. Um, we've never had a private um, uh, abortion clinic down here. We've not had any um, surgical abortion I'm referring to. So it's all been very much um, public or if someone wanted to, to um, not go through the public system, they'd have to travel or find a you know a, their own gynecologist who could do the um, surgery for them locally. Um, and so we, myself and a couple of, one or two of the uh, um, local abortion providers through Barwon her th of starting up, uh, well, I'm actually starting it up, a private surgical abortion service through a day hospital down here, which will be fairly small. It's a modest, <laughs> a modest contribution to the demand. Um, but we're hoping that gradually over the next, um, you know, sort of few years, we can grow it. Uh, it, it can grow, sorry, and, um, you know, increase provider, increase the number of providers down here for to in just increase the options, essentially. So uh, we've we've also been, myself and um, Alex Bonner, have, particularly Alex, has been in, con in discussions with Barwon Health about how we can increase the public service to, you know, potentially offer medication abortion um, through through sort of GP VMOs through Bowen Health, uh, but that's still in discussion, as you'd imagine, with um, you know post post uh, pandemic uh, public health funding, um, trying to catch up with elective surgery and the like. It's pretty hard to get um, any funding for for anything that that doesn't reduce waiting lists in that direction. So that's where so where I am at the moment with that is just about to launch the uh, just a fortnightly operating list. Um, uh, through local GPs to start with, um, and then eventually, when I can get a, a secure and a, a secure and safer website, as I can arrange, I'll, um, there'll be a website. So it'll be we'll be on one eight hundred my options, um, the service, and the aim is to try and have it, uh, a, a, you know, as virtual a service as we can have it, so that it doesn't uh, overload my the rest of my um, practice with just. Uh, lots of lots of calls for for what's a very sort of specific niche um, interest of mine. Well, that's just tremendous, and you know it is it is all about building choice and building other options. And I wouldn't underestimate uh, the roll on effect of having a timely practice practice to deal with that group of patients because uh, we know that at this stage and you know a week or two can make a huge difference in terms of where what, what options they can uh, access so that's fantastic news um, uh, anyone else who's here would like to give us a bit of an update how are things going with Ballarat Community Health um Hi, I'm Jo from Black Community Health. We're, we're going along. We've seen a, um, quite a big increase in um, early medical termination um, since Feb. So the last few months we've seen quite an increase, Carol, and I don't know if you've been getting seen that at 1800. Um, and we've coped well with the demand. Um, we're still slugging along with IUDs and um, MTOPs and building relationships with the Ballard House Services. I, um, is Natasha chatting tonight? Um, I'm going to chat for her unless she... Right. Yeah. So we have, we're fortunate enough to have Natasha advocating for um, an improved stop list within our region as well, Ballard House Services. So um, that's once again just giving options to women within the region. So um, still getting quite a few from um, the Pyrenees and um, like Ararat, Horsham, places like that, which we're able to support, which is good. And I'd agree with Carolyn, yeah, really borderline coming in a bit later, like than what we'd like, like to see, would be hoping to get them a bit earlier, but um, that's okay. We're just tripping along what nothing do you think really that's about joe is that lack of initial access yeah I, I, especially um and it's sad um patty after the work we've done in the region that there's still that delay with some gps yeah. referring on and mm -hmm. the frustration women are feeling when they finally find our service um that they were delayed um 
which is frustrating because it shouldn't still be happening, but it is. Yeah. We, we hear this from not just your service, but, you know, <clears throat> from from lots of services yeah. and also patients that we see in our clinic. Yeah. Analysis as well. And it really, you know, makes you start to think that maybe we need to have a direct to consumer uh, campaign to, to let people know that they actually don't have to go to a GP in order to start this process. That's right. And that they have got a, a, an information service yep. in the form of 1-800-MY-OPTIONS. Mm. But it's just programmed into our DNA that mm. you have to get a Medicare referral to do something. Mm. And even I'm finding women um, go to the usual GP who are providers and then get them to have an ultrasound that's way too early that they have to pay for, you know, they've been told they need to come back in two weeks' time for another ultrasound because uh, they haven't been able to report on anything, they, yeah. you know, so that's frustrating as well. But a positive is out, outside our organisation, we've seen an increase in providers um, from other GP clinics in the region, which is awesome, and they're all really um, willing to work together to help provide a more cohesive service, which is great. For the you region. did have at one point a problem if somebody went on holiday. Yes. And I think, think now with the backup of the, the clinic and other uh, GP practices around you, yeah, there's a little bit more uh, leeway to see people yeah. in a timely fashion. Yeah. So Ballarat's great. Out of Ballarat towards uh, Mildura is still pretty crappy, but yeah. yeah. Yep. That's like, yeah. So we're happy to provide telehealth for the people outside Ballarat and work with um, sonographers and pharmacists and things within the region. So, yeah, which is good. That's fantastic. And um, so it segues nicely into me conveying Natasha's message. Um, and uh, Natasha was hoping to be here tonight, but, you know, uh, she's got a lot of other commitments on at this time of the day. So um, what, what she wanted to say is kind of in a way similar, but she's talking about surgical abortion more than um, medical abortion. They're, they do have a, a weekly clinic that does medical abortion at the hospital, but they have just had um, approval that their pilot, uh, that they ran of a fortnightly um, <clears throat> suction termination list has been embedded now and will be going forward as a fortnightly list. So that's really, really good news. Um, uh, it's had an interesting, again, an interesting roll on effect. So they have two practitioners, one who's a career registrar and the other who is a uh, advanced practice GPO who alternate fortnightly. But they are very well known within the community and they have supported a couple of the private practitioners who've wanted to do um, uh, a couple of cases where it was a fetal anomaly and they've referred them to the service, but the service isn't going beyond 12 weeks, but those two practitioners have assisted the private practitioners on the public list. And then the private practitioner has realized that this is something that they can do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really interesting, it's a bit like the model you were talking about that other services see that it's something that's happening and that could happen locally for women. And so the feedback from that private practitioner was that this, that they felt that they no longer had to seek help outside of the Ballarat region for their patients. So that's really good. Um, they're also working on having an alternating list. So there'd be within the Grampians region, there would be a list each week because the thing that's happened for Ballarat is there's now a, it's now a regional health service. <clears throat> is it called the Grampians Regional Health Service? Yeah. Yeah. So the areas that, that um, Natasha is looking for, and she's such a quiet achiever, she thinks she's not doing much, but she says she's flagged uh, trying to get uh, FTE at the stall, stall, stall. I can't say that word. It always sounds like stall. <laughs> Stoll. Stoll. <laughs> okay, doll. <laughs> the day centre in Stoll um, is a, a standalone day centre and they really <clears throat> haven't got the capacity to be doing major surgery, but they haven't got the workflow and they have been branching into some major gynae and she's offering them a easy solution where they would be able to fill their lists, but fill it with a low, uh, low acuity um, 
early termination list up to 14 weeks. So they're looking at that. And um, the other alternative is that Dr. Dan Wilson, who is actually a GP practitioner in Maryborough, is looking at uh, starting a list in Horsham. So <laughs> while they haven't quite got there yet, the seeds are being sown. And what they're saying is that there's been a culture change in the response they get from the CEOs. I'm sorry. Um, uh, from the CEOs, because I remember 10 years ago approaching Gippsland and being told not to come and visit, uh, not Gippsland. Yeah. I was told the same there. Gippsland, yeah. <laughs> Gippsland and the Grampians both told me not to visit. So I think this is a really big change and, uh, you know, just a shout out to the work that is happening there. <clears throat> um, I've seen in the notes that uh, Gippsland would like to have a little bit of a chat. Um, I'll uh, <coughs> segue to Gippsland while I take something for the frog in my throat. So Heather, would you like to talk to us about what's happening at your neck of the woods? Okay, thanks, Patty. Um, yeah, so Heather from um, Bernsdale, which is, there's a Gippsland sexual health hub, East Gippsland. Um, just like to say, since Patty came and Kath came down and offered IUD training to our new GP, um, we've had, you know, a constant request for IUD insertions, which has been fantastic. We average one, one a day, um, we're open, well, we have a GP two days a week. So that's been fantastic. Um, and really grateful for Patty and Kath coming down. Um, some of the issues that have cropped up at Christmas, we had a bit of a spike of later presentations. So had to refer to our local GP service to coordinate stops, um, but that seems to have settled down a little bit. One thing that we've also had a bit of a spike is probably needing women with a bit more ambivalence and needing some extra counselling and so accessing that and we've discovered the Melbourne online telehealth counselling service that has quite good rebates and um, support for women requiring that so that's been good um, yeah because we don't have our local counsellors or psycho psychiatrists, um, oh, sorry, sorry, psychologists, um, there's often a three month waiting list. You know, we haven't got timely responses for them. Um, one thing we also noted some women were presenting saying that GPs have said, well, we're not offering this service or trying to talk them out of service. So we've done a bit of a letter, email letter drop to all the GP clinics just saying, well, if you're not prepared to provide the service, then um, refer to Clinic 281 or refer them to 1800 by options because it's been quite a problem for some women. Yeah, so that's really all I wanted to say, but great to have clinical champions support as usual and we're plugging away, which is great. Great, um, great to hear, Heather. And look, that's interesting what you were saying about using the online service of the Melbourne pregnancy counsellors because I've been talking to a few other colleagues in the last week or so that they're also available for uh, patients who might want some input post procedure. Yeah. yeah. Post -procedure. Mm. During the pandemic, they really uh, elegantly pivoted to an online service. And um, I think they're on 1800 My Options. Yes. yes. Nodding there. Yep. Uh, Kath has just uploaded it uh, into the chat as well. And look, I couldn't couldn't recommend them high more highly, and they're so flexible. <clears throat> so mm. again, it's a, it's another helpful backup service that we have, so you don't have to feel that you're alone or or have to put someone on a waiting list that's going to be four or five months long. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks, Patty. <laughs> Terrific. Um, <clears throat> we've also had some really positive news from the uh, the doctors who work quite closely with the Warrnambool hub. Is it called the Western hub or what's it called? Southwestern. It's called the Southwestern hub. I call it the Warrnambool hub. It's based mm -hmm. in Warrnambool. Um, and um, I have a fairly simplistic view of the geography of Victoria, as you all know. Um, it is improving with the number of trips that I take around. Um, and we are going to go down and visit the Warrnambool team. So there is a um, community-based hub there and they work very closely with the team at 
Warrnambool Hospital and I was just talking to the lovely Rosie Buchanan last week about their service. So uh, they have a weekly um, MTOP service and they can absorb into the two or three gynecologists who have lists they can absorb in their surgical uh, abortion care. And we have noticed since they um, have formalized that referral pathway that the number of referrals that we're getting from that Portland Warrnambool area who are in the second trimester because they missed out on a service has actually gone down. So when I did that audit, it really does uh, show that if we, if there is a service locally, women will go to it. And um, so that's been really good. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're looking at some way of working out how many cases they might be missing and are they, uh, they're really keen, Carolyn, to work out if they've got their service about right. Um, they've been training a couple of GPs from the local community health centre to do um, to do MTOPs and one in particular to do curettes if needed, um, if there was retained product. So they're really mentoring and that seems to be a really good um, solution. One of the things they've asked us to do, and we had a success with this when we went to Bendigo last year, is they would like us to present at the hospital mm -hmm. the concept of immediate post-placental insertion of um, IUDs and um, to um, insert that <coughs> concept as something that could be um, absorbed. So uh, that had been initially something that uh, several of the consultants at Bendigo told us was very difficult to get um, approval for, but they are now doing that routinely. And so Rosie would quite like to do that initiate that in um, Warrnambool so that after cesarean section um, to start with that they would insert uh, Marina IUD. <clears throat> so we're hoping mm. to do that and have an evening with uh, the local providers mm. and um, that will be our next whistle stop. Mm. Yeah. After Bendigo. After Bendigo, yeah. And then the other uh, good news I wanted to share with you was uh, just the work that's going on in the Castlemaine Kyneton um, uh, area and uh, <clears throat> the work from the Castlemaine um, GP practice run by Mark Ferrugia and Richard Mays. And again, just to illustrate how training, a, training a, a group and making sure that they are really well supported seeds um, confidence in the neighboring communities and uh, neighboring practitioners. So Mark couldn't be here tonight. So he sent me a letter to read to you all and I thought you would like it. Um, um, I have to confess that I subscribe to the idea of just starting and building things as they go as opposed to getting all the forms or paperwork or governance in place and then having to start. A man after my own heart, but I'm not allowed to, to operate in that way because I'm not a individual practitioner, but he is. So that's the way he works. Richard Mays and I started with MTOPs with referrals coming from the Loddon Mallee Women's Health and from 1800 My Options. Other GPs in our practice started to get interested and then joined in. In the last year, we've had five more doing up to two MTOPs per day, five days a week. Mm. That's a lot. Mm. We still don't fill the 50 slots a week we have allocated. They've allocated the possible 50 slots a week mm. to do MTOPs. Mm. Um, the champions, we're lucky enough to take ownership of the practice in 2020, and then they drove things and they've renamed it Goldfields Practice. Meetings with the reception staff were undertaken so that they came on board and felt supported and got behind it. Without their support, nothing would happen. We, often, we offer no gap for family planning, we have a dedicated email for women's health section of the clinic. We need to do a lot more work on our website. That's what he's wanting to do next. He's been in Geelong since 2014 and uh, wants to name Anne Hodgson as his mentor. Well done, Anne. Um, and have been doing uh, surgical terminations intermittently at Kyneton. I work in Castle Lane in a GP clinic and urgent care and do OBS in Maryborough. <clears throat> but both of those hospitals haven't had an appetite for family planning, but this is now changing for the better. I think all of 
the work of the clinical champions and the situation in America has been pushing that forward. With five doctors in the clinic doing MTOPS and hearing about what Dr. Massa and Sphere are doing, I thought we could do it at Kyneton. It really felt like the right time and the right people. The nurse unit manager and the theatre staff were really motivated. And after a couple of years of limping along, doing <clears throat> the occasional surgical termination in the early morning and adding on others that we could make space for, we've now been able to get a weekly list. <clears throat> Where to better to get our referrals than 1-800-MY-OPTIONS. <laughs> and so, uh, we, <clears throat> so we started to let them know and now we can be of use. And each week I drop a line and gently remind uh, people if we haven't filled the list. Initially, Kyneton felt that they could do eight a session, but the setup is a little bit small, so we've limited it to six, which is still, could I say, better than some of the public hospitals that manage a turnaround of four in an afternoon. Um, it's a start. I do the consenting using the online DocuSign and then email the hospital forms. Now, if I could just interject and say that um, Mark has come up with so many creative um, pieces of software so that you can do shared care with uh, nurses uh, around the place. Um, <clears throat> after that, I got to think about maybe Bacchus Marsh, Kilmore, Seymour or Hamilton. And he's gone on and listed his strategies with all of those other places. He then emailed me last week and said, I don't want to be boastful, but it looked like I might have got Bacchus Marsh online. Mm -hmm. So we'll just we'll just see how he goes. Yeah. <clears throat> and then he says, changing the culture of a stop being a once a week thing, we can do DNCs daily. Um, and we can bump up to 13 plus six for for our team if our next lists put them. And if our next list put them far beyond 14 to 40, you always respond and we can we could get them on your lists, which is great. And I'd just like to say in the last week, we have swapped several patients with the Kyneton team um, so that they, they're comfortable with the gestational ages and everybody gets a service. And then finally, what he wanted to say was, I'd forgotten how draining this can all be. I need to support the, the nurses at Kyneton so that they remain motivated to maintain the service. It is so different to the usual private patients that come through the service there. And it's so different for um, him to realize that, you know, in uh, supporting women and taking them through this journey, that he's actually supporting the staff as well. Mm -hmm. And just, just how tiring that can be. Mm -hmm. uh, I am so motivated by all that CCP does and the many of the people I've met in family planning. Thanks for your assistance. So that was really nice. And he's really achieving a huge amount there, as, as are lots of you, many of us today. Anne says he needs cloning. Um, we actually call him Superman in our clinic. And um, when, when we need to swap patients, somebody says, I'll just give Superman a call. And he just, he's so quick to respond. And it's also that sort of connectivity that him and his team have developed so that they're available online very quickly. Um, uh, and it's just really, uh, I think, heartwarming to see how many <clears throat> different groups are coming up with their own solutions uh, locally and how starting to push through a pathway encourages others. They see people like Mark and think, well, there's a really nice, fine, upstanding member of the community, or they see uh, Joe and her team, or they see the team at... Um, <clears throat> Bairnsdale, and so they think, well, I could do it too. So I think it's a really uh, good model. What we've been talking about recently is trying to lobby the department to think about getting, I don't want to call them super hubs, but like a hub that becomes a training hub. So they're not just a hub of supplying mm. services, but also of training the next group of people that will seed further. Um, anybody else want to tell us something that's been happening in their area or any questions? doesn't all have to be good news. We can cope with things being not brilliant. Oh, Carolyn. 
I just I just wanted to add on on that service that's operating out of Castlemaine and Clinton that when we speak to our callers about this service, we're often um, providing that pathway to abortion to people that are living all across Melbourne because it is the quickest to access surgical abortion almost in the state, honestly. And they don't require any kind of GP referral because it's all run by GPs. And just the difference that that makes to abortion seekers to not have to access a GP referral for a bulk build surgical abortion is absolutely immense, particularly for people who just can't afford to go and do that in their own community. They might have wait lists and things like that happening. So it's been a model that's not just successful in terms of managing the supply of services across the system. It's also really acceptable for people that are seeking abortion services. I also just wanted to throw in, because there's been a couple of comments about um, potential obstruction by GPs for abortion seekers. Now, I know that this is a really long-term thing to talk about, but there is a research project at University of Mel Melbourne about the regulation of conscientious objection to abortion. So they're looking at best practice models for regulation. They want to hear from people in the sector what they think would be the best way of regulating conscientious objection. So I'm just going to drop a link to that into the chat as well in case anyone's interested in contributing to that. We can share those links after the meeting too. We'll get Sarab to send around an email. Uh, <clears throat> saying again, um, sorry, Patty, do you, your choices clinic at, um, or your abortion clinic, uh, contraception service at uh, the women's, do, do they require referrals? Do you no. do referrals? No, because I think that's been an issue at Barwon. But for yeah. years we've, um, you know, we've struggled with this sort of needing referrals and part, partly the issue is streamlining for us because of when our clinic's run with respect to our, because we have one clinic a week and, and the surgery's only a few days later with respect to getting all the information um, tests done and all the rest of it. So we might actually, that might be a thing to explore um, yeah. with with Barwon to basically drop that because we are seeing, you know, not too bad, um, but there are enough scenarios where it's three weeks between um you know the 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 woman sort of starting to look and finding the gp etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'll uh, explore that further yeah and, and there's a <clears throat> you might want to talk to natasha about that Anne, because um uh <clears throat> as you be aware that that was a statewide initiative that all uh outpatient uh, departments across public hospitals have to have a referral from a gp and that was to make it more efficient so there weren't sort of uh, silly or uh, easily sorted problems just clogging up the system. So we had to go into that and have ourselves excluded from that, which was which was um, <clears throat> fraught and at times slightly ugly, but we got there. And so we don't have to, to be part of that, we're excluded. And so Natasha was under the same um, legislation and um, initially that was a real problem for them and so they're exploring it now and I'm not sure Joe if they've actually I forgot to ask her last week if they finally got that but that was the next thing she was advocating for not needing um, because there's a lot of obstructive uh, activity around the Ballarat area. Yeah, we still know, haven't heard anything about that. We're still doing the state well, statewide referral. Yeah. But um, yeah, that'd be awesome if it did. She's certainly working on that. And maybe yeah. we could combine forces and, and sort of see if we can deal with it at a state level. Mm. Because the state department, the government is, Department of Health is trying to put pressure on some other secondary hospitals in metropolitan suburban Melbourne to get their services started. So again, if we could have a, a statewide initiative on this, it would be really good. This is an example of um, you might uh, <clears throat> learn something from this network that there's somebody else out there with similar struggles to you that you could um, touch base with and they've probably got some strategies they could share with you. Any other comments? So I was going to then share a little, uh, uh, a little 
case vignette if people have got time to stay on we've got about 15 minutes so I think we've got time to do that so um I entitled it what what does that ultrasound result mean and uh the reason I entitled it that was because that's the most common question that I get asked by the residents and registrars and they get asked by GPs who are ringing them is what should I do about this ultrasound in the context of early medical abortion and I see a few nods around the place um yeah <clears throat> and we're talking really about post procedural presentations post procedural care so I think we'd all acknowledge that um prescribing the drug is kind of the easy part of it once you've got the patient in front of you and she's jumped all the various hurdles to get there, prescribing the drug is uh, the easiest part. The art of providing early medical abortion is, is coming up with some solution to get patients through in a uh, timely manner and then a way of being available and supportive for follow up and follow up that is rational and evidence based. So. That's one of the areas that we're looking at developing more um, recommendations. You'll be aware that um, the e-module uh, for early medical abortion has been released for some time now and is very well um, patronised. How many um, hits a week, Kath? You've just audited it. Yes, well, over 25 weeks we've had 86 uh, enrolments, which equates to about two point. No, three point three point um, three or so a, a week. So we're yeah, we're pleased about that. And and we've noticed that some people do the course two or three times. Mm. So they're obviously getting something out of it each time they do it. So the next stage is that we want to develop an e-module on post-procedural presentations and sort of pattern recognition. So I thought you might like to um, uh, just walk through this case with me. Uh, which doesn't make my centre of excellence look that excellent, actually. <laughs> so I thought that was why I would share it with you in the in, in the spirit of humility with the rest of you. Uh, and to make the point that very quickly you develop quite a uh, an expertise in this area. It's a really steep learning curve. And after maybe 20 or 30, you get to see the patterns of uh, resolution. That, that women have. They either have no problems or they have a bit of spotting, which annoys them to a greater or lesser extent, or they have troublesome bleeding, or they may have infection. So there's a few different behaviors and um, presentations that you start to recognize. But when you're first starting, everybody's really worried about it being a reta retained products that needs a curette or a failed medical abortion. And as you get more and more experienced, um, uh, you get to recognize who you can talk to on the phone and who you need to bring in for a review. But hospitals are behind us on this. They really are. And so I wanted to, to illustrate that with, you can't, you can't expect that because they do a lot of gynae and obstetrics that they know about early medical abortion to the mm. same extent as you guys do. Mm. So this is a patient, um, it's called a TH, and her last menstrual period was on the 12th of the 1st, and she attended our emergency with some pain and bleeding and was assessed, <clears throat> excuse me, assessed as having a pregnancy of unknown location. She was seen on the 4th of the 2nd when her beta HCG was uh, 14, and she was referred to, um, uh, it was felt that it was a very early pregnancy. She she stated that she was uh, considering an abortion. She'd had she has three children, has had two previous surgical abortions, so she was keen to um, terminate the pregnancy if she um, if it was uh, viable. <clears throat> so uh, she was referred to our EPAS service, and uh, on the thirteenth of the second, she had a beta HCG of seven hundred and eighteen. And she was going to present to her GP in two days time to have a medical abortion. And um, I just wondered if any of you wanted to comment on a beta HCG entry level at 
approximately uh, six days overdue her period of 718 and whether she qualified to, to um, uh, have a medical abortion. I was thinking, Joe, about your comments mm. about being sent for a scan too early. Yeah. So our general rule of thumb is that we won't do an ultrasound unless the beta HCG is a thousand or over, mm. um, just due to being early. Yeah. Um, with this person, would probably repeat the beta HCG in a couple of days and see where it is. Sure, rather than yeah. organising the scan. However, if she did have a scan, it would probably take 10 days to get the scan. Yeah, yeah. So um, the advice she got from our early pregnancy assessment service, which, you know, I also run, but it's a service about assessing for miscarriage and ectopic pregnancies, said, that, said to her their advice was the most important thing for her was to exclude an ectopic and that she needed to come back for beta HCGs and have a scan in a week. And she said, fiddlesticks, I want to terminate this pregnancy and my GP will do a scan for me in two days time. So any comments on that? Do we think that's a reasonable approach? Because in two days time for beta HCG, so by the 15th, it should be doubled, shouldn't it? You should be able to see something at that stage, but if it's if she's got, I reckon if she's got good dates and you've got you know no other concerns about it being ectopic, it wasn't seen on the original scan. I think just with the appropriate advice of we haven't excluded an ectopic um, TH, uh, but if you want to go ahead with your MS two step and you can, and I think she's going to comply with follow up. I think it's reasonable, and I would agree. Anybody concerned about it at all? I was delighted to hear that a GP had a bedside scan. So I thought that was interesting. And I haven't found out who the GP is yet because <laughs> I'd quite like to have a chat to them. <clears throat> so she, her beta HCG was repeated on the 15th. So it was 718. And on the 15th, which was the day she presented to the GPs, it was 2,200. So they did a beta HCG that day because their practice is to do one on the day that they give, give out the medication. Um, and they did a bedside scan. So at 2000, what would you say? You should be able to see, um, see a sac. So um, they saw her and gave her mifepristone, misoprostol, talked to her about um, uh, having a medical abortion. They did a bedside scan and said that they could see an early gestation sac, but didn't see a yolk sac. So my question there is, should they have gone ahead with the MTOP? Anybody like to comment? Got beta HCG of 2,149, so 2,200. Well, we, we often, like the quality of the scans that we often get aren't very good anyway. And, you know, we're often aiming for, for a higher level with that. But having said that, if someone presented with the SAC and that sort of level, we, we'd go ahead, but we'd say we haven't ruled out an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and, you know, if we got informed consent, we'd go ahead. Yeah, I'm really pro going ahead, <laughs> which is why I'm presenting this, mm -hmm. um, obviously. Um and Kate's saying she's, Kate Cooper says she's not scanning people who present early. Uh, several others were saying, yes, yes, they would do it. And so the other little bit of circum circumstantial stuff or context stuff is if she was presenting to the NHS, they wouldn't have done a scan. They would have taken, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is part of their pandemic protocol. They would have taken a good history. Uh, she may or may not have had an entry beta HCG, but they would have commenced it. The other thing is that there's now a very good long-term follow-up about the reconsidering this concept of a pseudo sac. So uh, when you were saying, Kathy, that there's a there was a sac in the uterus, but there wasn't a um, a just uh, a, a little yolk sac that you can't 100% exclude an ectopic pregnancy. This and and I can cite this for you all later. The, the study has shown, uh, looking at a cohort of 5,000 ultrasound scans with modern scanners, that if there's a good sac size, and this one was uh, 
10 millimeters that they all go on to have ongoing pregnancies. So it is, uh, we're probably being too conservative just by saying we have to have a yolk sac. Mm -hmm. When yeah. we first started in Australia, everybody wanted to have a fetal heart mm -hmm. and then we got down to having a yolk sac. Mm -hmm. Now we know that probably, even if we hadn't scanned, it was most likely going to be intrauterine. What were you going to say, Kathy? Patty, would you say there's a level of a sac size that you'd say you, you're happy, you know, no yolk sac, no nothing. But, I mean, we do go ahead with these, you know, with an informed consent. Kind of the characteristics, if it's nice yeah. and um, we, we didn't get that. placed and there's a good decidual reaction. Yeah. And, uh, we, we, we often don't get any of that from the radiology practice. But but I sort of think, well, if the sac's gotten to 10 millimetres. Yeah like wouldn't you have a cutoff sort of size for a sac that you'd say the chances of that being a pseudo sac are just you know I don't believe in pseudo sacs I think yeah. that's what I'm saying okay. and um, <laughs> you know the literature is now talking about that that you know I yeah. think it's as scanning has improved and vaginal yeah. scanning and the power of the machines has improved yeah. it's unlikely and then also we've got this confirmatory data of thousands of patients who didn't have a scan mm. You know, and if we do a good follow up for them, we'll pick those patients with the ectopic pregnancy. Um, yeah, my understanding was that um, HCG, the discriminating using HCG for discrimination of intrauterine pregnancies, was transvaginal. It was about 15, 12 to 1500, but trans abdominal, it's 5000. So I honestly think, you know, you, you, you know, you might have, if this was a TV scan, you might have seen a, a yolk sac, which is the way that, you know, previously we um, mm. we confirm it. So if it was just a transabdominal bedside and it wasn't transvaginal, possibly it was just too small to see yeah, the yeah. yolk sac and, that's and there. we don't know because we don't, you know, this is all hearsay. I don't know who the GP was, what their scanning machine was like. You know, there are many, many different types of scans available in um, the community from handheld to, you know, uh, machines that look very similar to the ones we use. Um, so then the next stage was, and I just want to hurry myself along because there's so much in the, this is such a, a rich history, this one. So um, <clears throat> the next thing is that she uh, takes, she doesn't take her Miffy Miso on the day that she sees the GP. She takes it when it suits her, which is the whole point of this Blumen medicine. So she takes it two days later. She takes her Miffy two days later. So on the 15th, she, she was 2,200. So two days later, it was probably in the 4,000s, probably. Um, so that's the day she takes it. So that was on the 17th and on the 18th, she takes Miso. And she presents on the 24th back to our department, uh, our wet department with what she describes as painful and heavy bleeding. And uh, she's seen there, uh, they feel that she's stable, but in light of her uh, pain and heavy bleeding, they give this 45 kilogram woman, the biggest dose of endone I've ever seen, and uh, keep her for the night because of her low blood pressure, and she has a scan the next day. <clears throat> and that scan, I'll just read you uh, the scan report. So her beta HCG on the day she presented, was 1960, the year of my birth. Mm -hmm. So it was 1960 on the 24th, it was probably 4,000 uh, the week before, but we don't quite know what it was. So it has dropped. Um, the conclusion from the ultrasound was that the ultrasound findings are more likely in keeping with a minimal amount of retained products. Uh, thickened left tube, but no obvious trope of elastic tissue noted. And given no previous formal ultrasounds, beta HCG tracking to zero is suggested if expectantly managed. By, this is by an ultrasound uh, consultant. So first of all, what do we think about that ultrasound finding? What does it mean? Does anybody want to comment? Is it, is it, is it surprising? Oh, I forgot to tell you the size of it. <laughs> so it was, Here we go, it was 14 by 11 by seven millimeters with a volume of 0.6 of a mil. It's consistent with where she is in her process, I guess I'd go on clinical grounds, doesn't sound like retained products. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anne, I'm feeding you the lines. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are, are others in agreement of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did she need a scan? 
query if she was if you were seeing her not in a in a in a uh, emergency department you might not give her a scan depending on her symptoms and I guess the philosophy we would like to teach and which I think all of you already employ is follow the symptoms and follow what's happening rather than uh, you know another investigation for at least two weeks okay um, <clears throat> what do people think about given no previous formal ultra signs beta hcg tracking to zero is suggested is that something that is necessary in um medical abortion it's really not it's really not and i think i'm preaching to the converted but here we have the center of excellence is already ordering another intervention another beta hcg tracking so our patient returned on the first of the third back to WEC. She was supposed to have um, beta ACG tracking to zero and, um, and a phone uh, and to come to our EPAS service for that plus or minus a scan. She didn't attend on the first of the third, uh, on the, the 28th of the second, sorry. So they rang her several times. Uh, she eventually presented to our emergency department. This is her third trip to our emergency department on the 1st of the 3rd and had a beta HCG of 1732. <clears throat> and she had another uh, ultrasound ordered. She was apparently saying that her pain uh, was, was significant and that she had bled a lot that morning. So she was admitted for observation um and uh given again uh, a large amount of opiate med medication and um monitored and uh during the six hours she was in the emergency department her bleeding was scant um she was a febrile but she was noted to still have considerable pain so she was admitted overnight as a query ectopic pregnancy and um had a further uh, ultrasound scan the next morning and that ultrasound scan says, the findings are very similar to the scan of a week ago. Mm -hmm. There are no adenexal masses. There, are no, there is no intra-abdominal free fluid. It is suggested of, of a slight amount of vascular retained products of conception. The measurements again are 11 by 12 by eight millimeters. So again, probably consistent and her beta hcg that day was a thousand that was approximately two weeks after her um, medication was given and so any comments about the drop of the beta or the need for a scan or anything else about this case is this an ectopic pregnancy What do you think? I'm not sure that my maths brain isn't very good, but the drop down isn't quite adequate, is it? Well, my maths brain wasn't very good either. And Kath and I had a bit of a, a thing about was it 80%. So you know that we like it to be 80%. It was 77.5% drop. Right. Okay. So <laughs> it's, you know pretty good <laughs> it's you know yeah. and uh that's if we estimate it was four thousand but they were doing their estimate from two days before she got her uh miffy so the pregnancy was ongoing at that stage so there was a an issue about not quite understanding the process so um they decided that it was most likely not an ectopic at that point given the presentation and so uh, given her uh, ongoing reporting of very heavy blood loss, not, not, which hadn't actually been wit witnessed, but she was sore, she had um, a curette the following morning. So at this stage she'd had, I just wrote it down before, she'd had three scans, three trips to our emergency department, five phone follow-up attempts, one admission and a curette. And the curette, just to cut to the chase, because it's 7.05, the curette showed that A, there was 
one gram of products of conception that mm -hmm. looked partially necrotic and looked as if there was a chronic endometritis involved. And her swabs came back with <clears throat> strep B and mycoplasma hominis several days later after she'd been discharged. So I think there are quite a few learnings there that she had a lot of interventions that may or may not have been necessary. Does anybody want to comment on her swab results? Oh. So Joe was saying, too, could another yeah. dose of miso have helped? Yeah, quite possibly. And some centers are really fond of giving a second dose of miso and actually giving it to the patients. So they've got it on them. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is that, you know, in, in this setting with someone who is um, symptomatic like that, it, it is most likely that it's the infection that's causing mm -hmm. um, that ongoing pain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, don't, yeah, I, don't forget about infection I, while you're trying to analyze the scan. I, repeating. Yeah. I, that's always my, I don't know what your experience and the other, the other um, clinicians who treat this in the, always my, my approach is give the antibiotics first, do the scan if they're not getting better. Because so many times that's the thing, and you don't want to take someone to the, you can if you can avoid it, don't take someone to theatre who's got an infection. Um, you haven't probably treated it, and so many of them will get better when you treat the infection, which complicates the RP the products. Um, so yeah, definitely. So I really the reason I, I I mention this is that oh Natasha, hello, we've just been bragging about your service before you arrived. Lovely to see that you're on board now. Um, so the point about this was that this woman was a, a, a very good yeah. candidate for a medical abortion because she presented so early and yet she ended up having so many interventions for what was probably a slightly infected but normal process of resolution and so you've all shared your wisdom with me tonight and you know, don't doubt yourselves and, or, and always think you need to refer on for a scan or for a gynae review at the mm -hmm. hospital, because a lot of the young registrars haven't come through any training program and nor have the consultants in those areas. So just remember that, that you do have quite good pattern recognition skills. That's, you know, as clinicians, that is what we all share and <clears throat> that quite a number of these cases can be managed themselves. Um, in another uh, service delivery model like we are now seeing in the UK and Northern Europe post pandemic, this woman would have never had any of those investigations. Mm -hmm. She would have had an, uh, a low sensitivity urine test follow up. Mm -hmm. She would have had swab, she would have had swabs done. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, antibiotics first before other interventions, yeah, mm. because the curette itself is not a benign mm. thing necessarily. Does anybody else want to say anything? Natasha, did you want to uh, add anything? We've talked about uh, all the gains that you have made recently. Oh, there she is. Are you thanks so much, Patty. Yeah, I was just going to say thanks to Caroline from 1800 for all your support as well with getting that our service going. Thank you. Yeah, we were just talking about like having the data strength to be able to make recommendations now is really, really helpful. Mm. Yeah, so thank it's you essential. all. Mm. Um, oh, can I just add one yeah. little thing that uh, the women's have. Um, uploaded a whole lot of new dates for Implanon training um, and they're on our website and I will put them put the link in the chat and we'll organise to send out um, a summary of, of the different links. Uh, and the response was attended. overwhelming wasn't it just oh. in, in line with what you were saying before Carolyn that yeah. uh, provision is dropping but the hunger of uh, potential providers is still there and I think we've 
just about filled most of them. Yeah, mm. but three no, quarters. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, we got spots. on uh, our communications unit um, put out some Instagram posts, and yeah, there was a really big spike in activity and people booking in. So it was really good. You know, we went from zero to about twenty five in no time. So yeah, keep an eye on the women's website. I can't actually link it at this minute, but um, yeah, if the, you can mm. just have a look at the women's website. So Rav, we'll give you the final word. Um, would you like to put a plug in for the Sexuality Conference? Um, can do. Just a second. Sure. It's happening on the 30th and 31st of May. Um, those were the new dates after it was postponed because of flooding in regional Victoria. And where's it going to be this year? Um, same as always, Cresswick. Mm -hmm. um, the RACV Goldfields Resort. And people who had um, tickets previously have been sent an email about um, receiving the tickets again. And if they wanted to not attend, then those tickets will be refunded and then um, it will be given to people on the wait list. Okay. So get, get, on, list. Yeah, get online and have a, have a look, guys. And we'll hope to see if as many of you as possible at that networking event. Okay. Good Thanks night to all. Bye for now. Bye. Oh. Oh. Oh, Dohani has a question. Stop, Patty. <laughs> Dohani. Hi, Betty. Can you hear me? Hi, Dr. Dohani. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Great to see you. And thanks for all the support that I had with you. Um, I just have a question regarding the case that you just presented. So this is a lady who had an early pregnancy with a beta HCG of 700. And then um, uh, the question was, one of the questions was whether we can go ahead with the MTOP treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so with the 700 beta HCG, most of the time we are not able to see a sac at all. We might see like, uh, you know, the reports always say there's a cystic structure, which could be a gestational sac, and then, you know, may have to repeat in one or two weeks time. So we haven't confirmed it's an IU pregnancy, it well could be, um, or whether it is, you know, an ectopic pregnancy, we haven't excluded. So in terms of prescribing MTOP at that stage, so one of the criteria for the um, medication is a confirmed IU pregnancy. So how would you go on deciding or my question is, is it safe to prescribe uh, the MS2 step? Um, even though we haven't confirmed that it is an IU, it's likely to be because they have seen certain changes in the um, uterine cavity. Or um, if we have the facility to repeat the scan, um, whether it is advisable to um, get it done um, as a precaution. Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and I was hoping to sort of tease that out. I hoped that we had teased it out. Maybe we should just tease it out a little bit more. Is it really depends on the resources that you've got and the service that you've set up and what follow up you can have. So number one is it is actually now being shown to be quite safe to do very early medical abortion without seeing a sac. And many services across the, across the world are delivering just such a service, but it's dependent on a really tight uh, certain follow-up so that you follow up to make sure it's dropped because we know it doesn't work for ectopic pregnancies. But <clears throat> if you've got certain dates and the woman is under five weeks and her beta is 700, the chances of this being an ectopic that will rupture in the next week is, is very low, very, very low. So if you had good follow-up, yes, you could do it without it. The point I made about this case was that she had a beta HCG of 700. She had a plan to see a doctor who could scan her two days later. And I would expect that we would have got into the zone of differentiation in two days. So if that doctor had a bedside scan available and was confident and had seen a gestational sac, they could also go ahead, yeah? 
So either thing is fine. But if you are still in a, in a service where, you know, it's recommended that you would do one scan and make sure, what we're trying to suggest is, as Joe said before, for goodness sake, don't end up doing two scans, costing the woman twice as much by picking to do a scan on the very day when her beta HCG was 700. Wait till it's probably in the zone of discretion. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks, Patty. Yeah, the, the problem that we do see is... None of them are wrong. Uh, the TGA says that the person doing the prescribing has to be confident that it's intrauterine. Doesn't yeah. say you have to have a scan. Yeah. But we really understand that some people, you know, like I, I scan everybody because I've got a scanner there, you know, but I don't work in a general practice, you know, and it's, uh, and if I was just starting the service, I probably would want to scan somebody, but I would really take heart to what Joe contributed that wait till you're likely to get a scan that is meaningful if you're going to have to you know uh, postpone her procedure that's right the problem that we have is uh, the refers that we get is from the other gps they do the ultrasound and the beta oh, hcg yeah. is 400 to 500. <laughs> yeah. so otherwise we would probably definitely wait at least if it's about you know uh, to get a proper scan if it's about thousand but when we have those early scans, when their beta HCGs are at two, 200 sometimes or 500. Um, so that's where I want to make the well, point. Then we could tease that one out for you, um, you know, because people who've had to go have already left and you're, we're still talking. So let's just finish that one. So yeah. Joe tells you, look, I've got this woman, uh, the GP did everything, did their swabs, they're all clear. Her beta HCG was 700. She's really onto it. She did a positive pregnancy test the day after a period was missing. Uh, this is probably day five, you know, day um, 28 plus five. And her beta HCG was 700. They did a G, they did a scan. She got a scan that day, amazing. Um, and it shows nothing, brilliant. And now mm. she's coming to see you the Monday after that. And that might be, six days after the beta HCG was 700. So you could do a repeat beta HCG that day. And if it had gone up by an increment of, to the power of three, so it'd be well into the four or five thousands, and you took a really good history from her and she wasn't in pain, you could actually do it that day and follow her up really closely because her beta should drop really quickly. As long as you had really good, uh, you know, you thought it was a person that you were likely to see. And I know some of us struggle with that, but there are patients that you would be, be able to think that I'm gonna have a good relationship with this patient and get her beta in a week. Thanks, Freddie, thank you very much. Because that is, that is annoying for the patients that they're, they're kind of having, if they ring you and say, I'm off to have your scan, you can run an intervention and say, don't scan now, wait a couple of days, yeah. <clears throat> But otherwise, if you present it with that, that might be a way around it. Anybody else want to comment on that strategy? Do you think you could do that, Joe? Yeah, we do do that now. So yeah. the referrals do come through. And if they say, I've got a referral um, for an ultrasound and based on when their last normal period was, I'll tell them whether to wait. Yeah. Um, or yeah, so yeah, we do do that quite a bit, but there's then the women that do present with all their, if everything already done. And yeah, like today, Bill Hardy had this presentation today. That's what I was just laughing about. It was an early scan. They were really well, they had no pain. And six days ago, their beta was 500, say. You'd expect it to be above 3000 if it was an intrauterine, you know? So uh, if you took it and it was 900, then you'd be worried it was an ectopic. If it's 5,000, it's most likely to be intrauterine. So you could uh, give the mTOP. Not saying you have to, but I'm saying that you are, the, the data is, is that that would be safe and it might, might help <clears throat> for that patient. Okay, I've talked too much as always. Uh, lovely to see you all. Great turnout. And uh, we will see you at the next one, which is in. It's, in the end of it's on the end of my thing. It's 20th of June. Hmm.
20th of June. See you all then. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Who's this one? I don't know. No, no, no. Oh. I don't know who that is.